right? Looking for some rapport, looking for a point of connection like, oh my gosh, that person likes the Smurfs. Well, I like the Smurfs. That person played with Transformers as a kid. So did I. Or whatever. I'm just using lame examples, but you get the idea. Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy. A Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your mystery meat sandwich. Greetings, compadres. Here's your mystery meat sandwich for today. People have one thing in common. They are all different. And that is by Robert Zend. That's a really profound one, so I'm going to repeat it, of course. People have one thing in common. They are all different. That's your no duh moment for the day. But it is true. It is really, really true. Of course, there are so many ways we're similar. We know that. But gosh, you know, it's interesting talking to people who you may have thought maybe had a similar viewpoint on something as you did, or perhaps thought the same way, but maybe don't. And actually you had no idea. This happened a lot during COVID. I found as we were attempting to go back to school in person, there were people who talked to me, assuming that I had the same viewpoint that they did or the same perspective on things. And it was really weird and awkward. And then I'd get somebody else talking to me who thought, the same thing, that their viewpoint was a shared viewpoint with me. And it was so crunchy. I still get crunchy when I talk about or think about those kind of situations because it's really, I don't know, it's kind of one of those things where you have to kind of stand back, right? And look at uh, the situation and kind of listen to the content of what they're saying. And I, I just really don't feel comfortable anymore talking about a lot of, I'll call them hot topics, unless it is with people who I have found to be safe people, like tried and true safe people who know that even if I say something totally bananas and off the wall, or I use a canceled word, which happens all the time to me because I'm old, that will just become something for that other person in a safe group that it's just like water rolling off a duck's back. It's not a big deal to them. They kind of know what I meant. They, you know, give me grace on it. They forgive me. They don't get angry. I mean, those people are the bomb, right? Those guys are the gems, the safe people. And so shout out to my safe people. You know who you are. You're awesome. I love you to death. And thanks for letting me just screw things up or say things off the cuff. I appreciate it. And I love you. There it is. So um, I also want to mention before I move into the chaplain's chat that there's this awesome documentary about Tower Records. And if you have not seen it, you need to see it. If you lived near a Tower Records, as I did growing up in Mountain View, California, there was a Tower Records not super far from our house. And going there was always an experience. And I'm not sure if the employee handbook at Tower Records had sort of a model demographic of employees that they pulled from, but it seemed to be that most folks had to have interesting hairdos and interesting outfits and interesting piercings. I mean, you name it, it was interesting. 
And I loved that about Tower Records is that people were so different from me, but I definitely felt like a fish out of water. So my tendency at first would be to judge them, you know, because here I am and I'm kind of walking in in my like jelly shoes and I've got my culottes on and um, just kind of like this teeny bopper with you know, my keychains with a thousand keychains and no keys. And I just felt like, you know, these dudes were pretty different, you know, so I noticed it right away, but it was always very interesting. And as you can imagine, the people watching was off the hook, just off the hook. And now I'm in a place where I realize that I'm kind of like, and I, I won't spoil the documentary, as my father would say, documentary for you if you haven't seen it. But the bottom line with this Tower Records thing is that it no longer exists because of, I'm going to, this is just my opinion. I'm sure there are other reasons, but because of a lack of willingness to change. And I see that happen in my own self. So I'm just rolling myself under the bus because I find, of course, I feel like, oh, well, you know, you just do it this way or this is how it's always been done. And so this is how we do X, Y, and Z. I'll get those mentalities going. And I'm going to be the first to tell myself that those are unhealthy mentalities rewinding for a second to the canceled words. It's not okay for me to continue to use a bunch of canceled words or terms that I know are canceled. If I know better, I need to do better, and I need to be more accepting of new knowledge. And so that's just kind of a personal challenge that I'm throwing out there that I'm sharing is that I really, I want to get out of that mentality of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to use this word and you should be okay with it because <clears throat> this is how I grew up or whatever. It's not okay. And it reminds me of my grandmother, God rest her soul, who's no longer here. And like many people from her generation, she was pretty racist. And that's not, you know, something that I want to be. <laughs> it's not something I aspire to. It's not a goal is to have a mentality where I'm using words that it's okay for me to use. And I'm telling myself it's okay for me to use. I just need to keep growing. I need to keep learning. I need to keep adjusting. And if I don't, I'm just going to be this crotchety old person using canceled words. And so that's not goals right there. Anti-goals. It's the opposite of goals. And now, on to the chaplain's chat. As I move into the chaplain's chat, I just want to say that if you have not started with the Enneagram yet, you know what? Maybe give it a whirl. Maybe it's time. It's super interesting, and you don't have to learn about it through these episodes. You can go online. There are so many resources to learn about it, but really, it's just learning about ourselves, of course, and getting empowered through that. All right, so this is what it is today, people. This is what it is. I don't know. I don't make the rules. All I know is it is 10 ways to spot in Enneagram type four, and fours are known as the individualist. Individualist, we like it, right? All right, so fours are generally defined by their sense of being special and different from other people. They're often creative, and they present a unique, distinctive persona to the people around them. Fours experience deep conflict internally that they long to connect with others, but they feel, as far as I understand it, so unusual that they have a fear. Maybe that people won't accept them or understand them 
I know I've had this fear before that like my message won't get across, but I think um, as far as I understand it, more than being introverted, it's like a fear that what if you don't get me type of thing. So they really would love to be seen for who they are, but it's challenging. And so for them internally, so their deepest fear would be forced fear that they are flawed and missing out on some basic aspect of happiness that other people have access to. Gosh, that resonates. I totally understand where that comes from. I have that too. I'm kind of feeling for me like I'm missing um, some handbook to life. You know, I just, one of these days, I'm just going to wake up and realize that everybody else is going to know that I have no idea what I'm doing in life. (laughs) So that's one of my deepest fears. And I'm not a four. There you go. To cope with this fear, the fours will amplify what is different and special about themselves, looking for a niche in which they can truly be appreciated. Yeah, sounds smart to me. Their core motivations are their desire to express their individuality and to be unique. So I think they've kind of nailed that. That's a great core motivation. And they do this through creative endeavors and by over-identifying with the aspects of their personality that they view as lacking or deficient. Key personality traits of the Enneagram for distinctive inner and outer presentation, prominent artistic outlets, quirky and endearing traits, a kind of a melancholy expression, a strong sense of identity, and fours may feel a sense of emptiness, and they're passionate about self-expression. So again, I mentioned the creatives in the last one. And I always think of, when I think of the fours, I think of Wedding Crashers and I think of the brother in Wedding Crashers um, who's kind of got that artistic, kind of dark, deep personality. And I don't know, it just it just is what I think of. So if you haven't seen Wedding Crashers, I guess go see it. Super funny. Okay, number three, core values of a type four, Enneagram type four. So this is the third of the 10 ways to spot in Enneagram four. Authenticity and self-expression are some core values and are known to be the pinnacle of the individual's existence. So being authentic, right? Being authentic have to be true to themselves. Their ultimate goal is for the world to recognize and appreciate their unique identity. I was going to say ability, but I guess in a way that too. They strongly believe that their striking difference from others should always be consistent. I like that. That makes sense. And succumbing to trends would be considered the ultimate act of self-betrayal. I love it. I just, I love it. I love those people who are just like, this is me. You don't like it. Not sorry, not sorry at all. All right, so number four of how to recognize an Enneagram four, the individualist. Individualists are often offbeat. They have a strong sense of self-identity and pride. They pride themselves on being unique. They're often found pursuing some sort of creative endeavor, as we talked about, but more specifically, What those can be often is music, animation, anything to do with the arts, creativity in food, or comedy. Comedy, what? Love it. Their ultimate goal is to accurately present their true selves to the world, as we talked about with authenticity. And they want to feel healthy and real and whole, which is, you know the same thing that we all want to feel, but I think at an, we're going to call it an amplified level. And so as the fours explore their own psyche, they explore it through the lens of, is this true to me? Is this authentic to who I am? 
almost to the point where they don't need to think about that because it happens organically. I'm not sure if fours are going to appreciate this, but this is something that um, that I dug up was that thrift stores and flea markets are particular favorite picks of individuals. And I'm not saying if that's your thing that that's bad or wrong. I just thought it was funny because some of these things that come across as like blanket statements are sometimes like, what? Get out of here. That's so not. No. <laughs> So I don't know if you love flea markets and thrift stores and you're a four right on, then this works. It's all good. And it's happening when it comes to self-expression. Individualists take their presentation very seriously. They constantly evaluate every decision and its alignment with their personal values. Again, coming back to that authenticity as a pillar. Okay. Number five on how to spot an Enneagram type four. And this is going to be the health and the unhealth of the Enneagram type four. So when they're healthy, fours create thought-provoking and groundbreaking works of art that shift perspectives toward the greater good. They're recognized as idea synthesizers who can help others rethink what art should be. I like it. Major shifts in art styles and fashion eras are largely due to the out-of-the-box thinking from self-actualized individualists. Since they possess the ability to rework past experiences into new works of art. Love that so much. If you've ever been to one of those art shows that's got the you know, recycled materials or the old crap, you know, that is now turned into something new. I love that. That's just so lovely to me. And fours are also, by the way, highly attuned to their complex well of emotions. Individualists undergo a process of a metamorphosis in the cocoon of self-acceptance before fully emerging as a butterfly with wings to soar, just like Mariah Carey. But when they're average, fours let out their stress through a creative outlet, but they may be bonding with only like-minded people. And sometimes, you know how that can get, sometimes we're not rubbing up enough against people who grow us and stretch us. At least for me, that's what I found. Emotionally intense and introspective, they're seekers of authenticity, as we know, and sometimes this comes at the expense of others' patience and feelings. So they can be a little self-absorbed, and artistically expressive individuals generally maintain their personal mood and inspiration, and they can't really bridge from what that is very easily, as far as I understand it. So this results in them actively seeking praise and flattery, which I haven't seen very much, but I'm sure it's a thing. And um, when I read about the four, I did see that more than one place. So they may be strongly offended if others try to copy or relate to their experiences interesting. When they are unhealthy, fours become excessively moody. They can become depressed and fragile. They can develop an extreme tendency to ruminate, which is intrusive to their natural creative energies. I can totally relate to ruminating. <laughs> In extreme cases, they may lose their grip on reality and resort to extreme sensory coping mechanisms such as alcohol or hallucinogens, or let's just call it anything to escape, anything to escape the way they feel. They search for this missing piece and it ends up sometimes leading them down a never ending spiral of dead ends roundabouts, I would say, hence the ruminating. That's what it would be for me. 
they can fall into the same ditches and make some mistakes <clears throat> make the same mistakes excuse me if they refuse to admit their self-destructive behaviors and thinking patterns yeah been there and they're prone to developing the belief that there's something inherently broken about them don't you hate that i hate i hate that cuz i feel like that's kind of a human thing too is that a lot of times a lot of us can can feel like there's something wrong with us and really we're just human beings and human beings are so complex. So back to the fours, at the peak of their stress, individualists may delete their entire presence from the web and isolate themselves from the world and just turn inward. And I know for me and for the 12 step groups that I'm a part of, we talk a lot about isolation. And we talk about how when we're not feeling something is going well in our lives, or we're not feeling like we're in the mood that we want to present to the world, that's the first thing we run to is isolating. When the reality is, at least for us um, in the 12 step community, that the opposite is true that doing the opposite of what you feel like doing is kind of paramount to our recovery. All right. Number six of the 10 ways to spot an Enneagram type four. These are the growth tips. First one is practicing positive affirmations. Fours are prone to negative self-talk. By focusing your mind on positive thoughts, you can develop a kinder, more positive self-image and mindset. I talked when we were talked yesterday about the threes. I was talking about how my counselor in rehab uh, made me do this thing where I was looking in the mirror and telling myself that I loved myself and how awkward it was, but it worked. I don't know. I'm just saying, just throwing it out there. Maybe it's something you want to try. Viewing yourself is number two for these growth tips for Enneagram fours. Viewing yourself from another person's perspective. So not just your own perspective. Keeping in mind that, you know, our own feelings throughout time about ourselves, of course, are valid, but they are also subjective. So emotions are not all you are. They're also a part of who you are because, you know, emotions do that thing where they signal us to different triggers that perhaps, oh, I, every time this song comes on the radio, for example, I feel a certain way. What's underneath that? What's behind that? Why is that part of who I am? Maybe I want to change that. Maybe it doesn't really affect my life that much. But just learning to um, have that bit of sensitivity toward those things. Third, considering the ways in which you are similar to those around you. Focus your attention on how you're different from others is not always going to be helpful. Instead, looking for ways to connect. What is it that I might have in common with this person would be a question that a four could ask themselves. Doing something like this would help, inherently help to formulate those deep relationships, right? Looking for some rapport, looking for a point of connection, like, oh my gosh, that person likes the Smurfs. Well, I like the Smurfs. That person played with Transformers as a kid. So did I, or whatever. I'm just using lame examples, but you get the idea. Another tip would be starting small. Fours may feel like they lack the confidence and discipline to get things done. If what you want to accomplish feels overwhelming, break it up into small, achievable steps. Yeah, that's hard, right? Like that is sometimes hard to do. Um, but it's also kind of confidence building, right? When we break things up into small steps and we get one or two or three of those steps done, all of a sudden, it's like, wow, I'm actually on the path to accomplishing this bigger goal. Always a good thing for all of us, I think. 
And finally, learning to be open to constructive feedback, positive and negative. Ooh, okay, that's hard for me. It's essential for fours to get out of their heads and to learn to accept feedback from the outer world. Understand that negative feedback isn't an attack on who you are as a person. I'm going to read that again because I need to hear it again. <laughs> Understand that negative feedback isn't an attack on who you are as a person. And positive feedback isn't something to dismiss or devalue, which, yeah, I'm totally famous for doing. There are important lessons to be learned from constructive feedback. That's so poignant for me right now. Um, one thing that writing books, doing this podcast, showing up at school, these different things that are cringy to me and kind of scare me when I'd rather just kind of, you know, sit in a warm bed with covers all around me eating Cheetos instead of being out in the world. One thing that has really been a theme for me recently is to separate my personal value and worth from any of the things going on around me. So for example, if I'm presenting to a group of parents at the school, let's say hypothetically speaking, of course, and Someone raises their hand and they go, why don't we just do this instead? And they throw a different idea out there. So instead of jumping in and going, well, we have tried that and this is what happened, you know, because usually what I do is I'll kind of be tempted to shift into this mode of like, yeah, we tried that already, didn't work. And, you know, we're going to do it this way, which, okay. You know, there's there's some value into some of that if said correctly in the appropriate and kind way, but there's also some value into just saying to somebody, you know what, tell me more, because you never know what other nugget you might hear out of what they're going to say. I'm just saying. So being open and embracing that constructive feedback, I mean, you're going to learn something, right? And for me, I got to keep learning. Otherwise, I stay stagnant. Number seven, do you identify with any of these celebrities? Here we go. Frida Kahlo, love her, beautiful artist. Billie Eilish, Rumi, love Rumi. You know I love Rumi because I'm always putting Rumi quotes everywhere, right? Brilliant. I love him. Well, you know, he's not alive anymore. You get what I'm saying. All right. Jackie Kennedy Onassis, Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan, Prince, Stevie Nicks, who, sidebar, apparently has a concert like tonight um, here in the Seattle area, and I'm not going. So that's a bummer and a crying shame. All right. Johnny Depp in the trial. Hate to say this, but it's my podcast. I can say it. I was Team Johnny all the way, Team Johnny. I know everybody has um, a different side to their story, so I'm sure there's truth to both sides. Winona Ryder is also a four. And Prince Charles. I don't really know much about Prince Charles, but apparently he's in the four club. Amy Winehouse, may the Lord rest her soul. Kurt Cobain, same, may the Lord rest his soul. And this is random to come right underneath Kurt Cobain, but Anne Shirley from Anne of Green Gables. So that's a hard left right there. And those are some of the known Enneagram type fours that you may identify with who are celebrities. Does it mean they're absolutely type fours? No, right? Just throwing it out there. Okay. Enneagram type four, number eight. Enneagram type fours as children may have super active imaginations. They may play super creatively alone, or they may organize playmates in original games, but then kind of divert and break off and do their own thing. 
They can be very sensitive. They can feel like they don't fit in. They can feel like they believe something is missing inside of them, some kind of microchip or something. And we kind of talked about this earlier, but something that other people have. So just kind of a lack of knowledge or a lack of how to fit in. And they grow into kind of not caring so much about the fitting in part. But that's the thing that I have actually seen volunteering at school is that sense of, you know, those kids who are a little bit just more sensitive, who um, they just get upset at things that other kids might not get upset at. And, you know, just watching how they process life, I think is so interesting and how they process the interactions that they have with other kids. So number nine, Enneagram type fours as parents. They can often help their children become who they really are and value that as a parenting technique. So they're usually super supportive of their children's creativity and originality. They're super good at helping their children get in touch with their feelings. Or sometimes they can be overly protective or overly critical, but they're usually really good with children as long as they're not too self-absorbed. But um, to help a child come into their own and become who they really are instead of, hey, this is the mold and you need to fit into it. I mean, I don't know. I'm not mad at any of that. I think that's great. What an amazing gift as a child if you had a parent who's a four who can help kind of realize, help you realize that it's okay to be who you are, and to really help you to step into it. And finally, number 10, Enneagram type fours in relationships, okay? Enneagram type fours in loving relationships are the true romantics, the Romeos and Juliets of the Enneagram of sorts, full of passion and adoration, Fours can develop truly deep bonds and feelings together with their partner. Fours know how to focus attention on their own feelings. And fours have the feelings of others in mind in a personal inner communication sense when they feel connected. When they feel connected and they feel like somebody gets them, right? That's when they can really shine And as friends and partners and children, when they really help those others that they're in relationship with feel safe to be who they are. As a mate, since they often feel a sense of deficiency about their own worth, and they may actually envy their spouse or partner, they maybe fantasize about kind of a more ideal life. Or they could have low self-esteem as they come to terms with all that they are not and look at it as kind of um, an area of lack. So fours in a relationship appreciate meaningful interactions of all kinds and are not afraid of conflicts. (laughs) I thought this was interesting. As long as they get to the bottom of things and have some time kind of withdrawing when they feel overwhelmed. So I thought that was really interesting because I think that prior to looking into this a little bit deeper, I thought fours were always kind of like non-people persons and that they just never wanted to get into a conflict, never kind of wanted to maybe be around people. And and I was totally wrong about that. Like I I was wrong, at least according to what I read recently. So there you go. Fours can develop an envious type of a sense of a personality that is then jealous of others who seem to have their proverbial shit together, if that makes sense. And yet, at the same time, there's not so much of an emphasis on caring about that to the point where they're willing to change because they're not going to sell themselves short on that. 
So in relationships, um, if fours find that they are jealous of their partner, it's probably, according to this, not going to last super long. I don't know. I'm not a fortune teller, but that's what it said. So if you love a four, remember that when they feel uncertain about the relationship, they will test you. They will test you to see if you love them and they'll try to evoke an emotional reaction. Hmm. It's healthy for you to be not only logical and caring, but also to show some emotion, even if it's less dramatic than, the par- than your partner and you're mostly being an active listener. Focus also on plenty of time to withdraw yourself and let them do that as well. And then your quality time, according to what I read, will be more enriching and fulfilling for both you and the partner so that you kind of create this air of better understanding. And remember that fours don't evoke emotions from you to be cruel. So they're not trying to piss you off. Because what they're feeling could be loneliness and could be rejection or could be a fear that they're not expressing themselves the way they want to because it's tough sometimes for them. So the key would be not to abandon them at that juncture. Instead, encourage them to find time to both explore their own spirituality, including their religion, um, or to seek a higher power or whatever it is, nature, whatever it is that fills them and to connect with a spiritual nature, a spiritual sense that they might have and to take care of their physical and mental health. And finally, you can give them permission to have space. And we're just talking about that whole idea of withdrawing and just spending some time alone. So also important is to Reassure them that you love them. Just remind them that you love them. I mean, we all need that, but I think some more than others. Finally, here's your bailout bag. The bailout bag is take what you like and leave the rest. So if you identify as a four, just remember, you know what? This may be applicable to you and it may not all be applicable to you. It's okay. Maybe you're like, yeah, I don't really have much in common with um, Rihanna. (laughs) And that is fine. It's totally, um, these are just kind of, again, high level wash over conversations that we're having about these different personality types just to broaden our knowledge and also to help us realize that there are parts of ourselves found in every single type. So maybe if you're not a four, you can ask yourself, and that's why I sometimes will interrupt these um, tips and I'll just say, oh, I identify with that because maybe you can learn something from stopping to asking, stopping and asking yourself, you know, hey, in what ways am I like a four? And in what ways can I not resonate at all? It's just kind of an interesting thing because you certainly will interact with people who are fours, um, perhaps be in a relationship with somebody who is a four. The more people you have around, of course, I have a lot of people in my house, the more chance I will have, you know, to have these different types popping up um, within my family unit. And, you know, it's fascinating and it's interesting. And, you know, kids and adults, people need different things and they need different things based on all of these past experiences that we've had and also things that are just kind of ingrained in the wallpaper of who we are and have become over time or who we've always been since we were kids. So on that note, be kind, rewind, and thank you for the honor of your time. 
Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best-selling author, speaker, 12-step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.